be successful as a student, um, maybe in some different ways than you have thought before. So we are excited that you are here. Just a couple of announcements from the NSLS is that remember, stick around until the end and you will have a link to fill out your form to give us your big aha moment, your big takeaway, and be able to enter in for one of those NSLS $500 leadership scholarships. So we want to hear from you and get your feedback. And then also that will serve as your application. But I'm about to turn it over to someone who I look up to so much and I have been following um, through social media, looking at his videos, and I'm just so happy to work with and bring in front of you. And that is Nick. And so I am going to turn it over. I'm sure he's going to be able to share so much of what he does and the impact that he has. And I know by you listening to his presentation today, you're going to be able to go out and make that impact as well. So thank you, Nick, for joining us today. And I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Appreciate it so much. Uh, you are just phenomenal. And uh, I am just so grateful uh, for you and for the opportunity here to speak with the students. Uh, I'll quickly uh, introduce myself. My name is Nick Cavuto. Uh, and I actually put right on side of my, uh, my tag there, at Nick Cavuto. So you can find me on Instagram or you know how to spell my name because it's a little bit unique. And um, yeah, so uh, I just want to invite you guys to connect with me uh, on Instagram. Uh, but let me just give you a quick context on my story. All right. So uh, I was born in a very, you know, uh, your average typical American family uh, in the Northeast, rather blue collar family. Uh, went to college. In fact, I actually dropped out twice uh, or was politely asked to leave with a 1.8 GPA both times. Uh, the story of success does come later down the road. Uh, but it was through me leaning on my intuition. And in fact, I did end up graduating with a 3.8 average uh, a few years thereafter. But um, it was a unique journey for me getting started really inside of uh, my career and finding what was right for me. And I did learn a lot of lessons around intuition and trusting myself and that deep inner guidance. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So to give you brief context on my story, I worked in the nonprofit sector for the first about five years of my life, uh, in my professional career rather. Um, and so from about 20 to 25, I worked in the nonprofit sector. Uh, and by the time I was 29, I was a millionaire. So let me tell you how I got there. Uh, I realized that I had a special gift when it came to marketing and specifically as a skill. And so I started working for, uh, first. the first company I worked for was a startup and I took their company from basically 20 to $25 million in nine months. And that was very specifically on my intuition. At that point in life, I hadn't even had my degree yet, but um, I knew there was something I was really good at when it came to understanding people and human behavior and human potential. And so that was kind of when things really started to click for me, when I could measure my confidence in the process that I was using mixed with my competence of what I knew as a skill. And we're gonna to talk today about how you can do that as well. But that was the first company that I worked with. I had just an audacious faith really that we could make a huge impact. And with $100,000 created $5 million in revenue. And from that point on, it was really unstoppable. I went and worked in Fortune 500, consulted with some of the biggest companies you've heard of like Microsoft, Pandora, Paychex, um, you know, tons and tons and tons of companies. I was responsible for over a billion dollars uh, worth of products inside of the suite, the HR and technology space. And uh, from there, I went to Boston and worked for some venture capitalist startups. I grew multiple companies from zero to three to $5 million in 18 months. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. But I discovered this whole thing. After I'd went to school, I knew enough about myself that my skill was able to be crafted and honed in. And uh, I started to really start figuring out what success looked like for me. And it wasn't what it was for everybody else. So I want you to write this point down because I think this is going to be very important for our conversation today. Success is what you've done compared to what you were created to do. And I'm going to say that one more time because I want it to stick. Success is what you've done compared to what you were created to do. Success is also the fulfillment of the purpose and the assignment for which you were created. This is where I started to understand that something was a little bit different around my life. I could have all the accolades and work for the big companies and do all the stuff. But by the time I was 29, I realized like it didn't really matter. 
I had to start redefining what success looked like for me. So let me use an analogy for you that I think will be really helpful. If a seed becomes a tree, is it successful? The underlining fact of this is that a seed is only successful when it becomes a tree that is fruit bearing. So if you have an orange tree that doesn't produce any oranges, was it able to accomplish what it was set out to originally do? So in order to be successful as a tree, it must bear the fruit and the fruit must have a seed inside of it. So in other words, if you only half complete what you are supposed to do in life, what you were created to do, what you were born to do, you're still not successful. I have finished my cause because I have kept the faith. I have been poured out. To me, that's what success looks like. Generosity is, at, is really at the core of success and what I count it to be today. So in a way, success is dying empty. And not empty internally, right? It's, it's this, the expectations and all the things and the expectations of our family, our friends, our colleagues, our bosses. Success is really letting it all go and getting to the finish line and saying, I gave all that I had to give and my gift to humanity has been given. It's saying and confidently saying that everything that I was set here to do, I've accomplished. Another thing you might want to write down in this process as we talk through what success looks like and we start discovering and uncovering how you can leverage your intuition to do it. I want you to think about this point. Success is not a pursuit. This was one of the hardest lessons I had to learn in life. Success was not a pursuit. And the problem is I was pursuing it. I'm glad that I achieved what I thought was success. And even in my story, you might've been like, holy cow, you're able to generate that amount of revenue where you didn't even go back to school till you were 26. And by 29, you generate a million dollars. Yep. And I can tell you that in my 20s, I said, in my 20s, I'll learn. In my 30s, I'll earn. And it's funny how that happened. So if you're trying to pursue success right now in the season of your life that you're in, it's going to run away from you. I've heard it said that uh, he who chases money, money takes wings, <laughs> right? It's kind of like you ever tried to chase a rabbit or chase a cat, right? All of a sudden it's like it runs away faster than if you try to bring it to you and manifest it towards you. So it just doesn't happen that way. Success doesn't just, you know, you don't just pursue it and then it shows up and it's this easy and effortless act that actually has a funny way of coming to you. So I want to look at the first connection here. And the first connection to me when it comes to success is finding whatever your divine source is. You know, the, the saying of in pursuit of the divine, all of these things will be added to you. So it's funny, you have the ability to actually attract the success that you want in your life. Because, and here's the key, success is a result of obedience to laws. I study a lot of Nikola Tesla, love Nikola Tesla, and uh, I wanna encourage you to do so as well. There are laws, there are theories that he followed. In the same way, a car doesn't try to run well. Well, maybe some of us are, at least when I was in college, I had a car that, that was trying to run well, all right? But at the end of the day, when you actually look at the mechanics of a car, it doesn't try to run well. It's just governed by the laws of the engine that created it. This is how things go with life. If you try to be great, you're not gonna be great. If you try to be successful, you're not gonna be successful. If you try to be prosperous, it's gonna run away from you. So the bigger question is success is a result of what? obedience to laws. And I'm not talking about just earthly laws. I'm talking about principles. And the first principle is that you have to discover what you were born to do. If I had to ask you the question right now, what is your unique gift? What would it be? And if you do know what your unique gift is, you might be thinking about the competition of other people who share a unique gifting, just like you have one. You might be thinking about like, I want to pursue what I feel like I'm called to do, what my unique gift is. But I don't want to have this overcoming feeling of imposter syndrome and 
there's other people who are better than me or who am I to be this special person? I want to go the opposite direction for you. I want you with all of your might to keep pursuing the gift. Keep pursuing the thing that really makes you come alive. And a lot of times when you're six years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, you have these things that you love to do where you lose time and space. Those are the things typically that have the closest attachment to your calling or to your intuition or to what success will look like for you later on in life. And when you came here to earth and you were born, you came with everything necessary that you needed to fulfill the assignment for your life. That's why school, it doesn't make us successful. We, we don't go to school to find our unique gifting because education is not about giving you a gift. It's about refining the gift that you have, but it can't give it to you. And that's why I'm compelled to be here with you today with this potentially alternate way of looking at what success looks like for you, for you and for your life, because I believe that your gift was built in by a manufacturer. I believe that it is something that's rather divine something that's rather unique, something that's gifted to you. So as you're assessing these points, I want you to think about this big idea. When you think about your dreams, your goals, the things that you really deeply want to accomplish in life, I don't want you to think about how you're going to do it. The how always comes, and I've learned that in entrepreneurship, that how is the wrong question. The what and the why have to continue to be paramount. And as my favorite book says it, we lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways, we acknowledge, we acknowledge. And we have to acknowledge what's in us and what our strength is in us and what that gift is in us. We have to see it. I wanna position this to you and suggest that there are things that you can do that no one else can do and you have no idea right now that you can do it. Some of you have an audacious level of belief that will allow you to create some of the most amazing products that have ever been created. Some of you have an audacious level of creativity that will allow you to write the greatest songs. And right now you don't even know that you possess that level of gifting. And I will share with you right now, the number one thing for me that changed the game. And it took years for me to do this. And it was to believe that I could actually do the thing that I was born with that was unique to me and nobody else. Given my circumstances, I was born to a drug dealer father and a welfare supported mother. I was labeled learning disabled. I was raised in one of the most impoverished cities in America. And the thing that I realized is that it didn't matter where I started. It mattered where I was going. Even though hardship in a lot of ways, that was my reality. Being stuck was my reality and what I experienced. The way that people live their lives is embedded in the stories that they tell themselves. So someone's opinion of you doesn't have to become your reality. And on one hand, you might be humiliated by the things that people have said to you, but on the other hand, you can be liberated. I don't want you to look at the way you are right now. You, it's hard to find true success if you measure the moment and the, and the position of where you're at right now. In fact, it can, actually, it can actually be a worse situation. What I want you to think about is what you could be. And then it has this funny ability to help you start finding what you should be. As Mother Teresa would say, um, inspire, detract, distract, dispute, Become like a pencil in the hand of God and start writing a new chapter in your life. How important is that for us? You know, there's this idea that a lot of people, especially in this season right now, they've lost hope. And when there's hope in your future, it gives you power in the present. So what are you hoping for? How do you find yourself leaning into something that's, that's way deeper? How are you going to allow this moment to be an opening of the door? Now, here's the idea. Um, is this process easy to go in this, do this internal work, to start really looking within yourself and being like, man, 
I know that I'm created for so much more. What could I really be? What potential do I really have? I know it's intense. Uh, changing the world is hard work. And if everybody could do it, they would. <laughs> so it requires patience. It's going to require persistence and a willingness to do whatever, honestly, whatever it takes in order for you to create a new life for yourself. So whatever you were, you were born to do, I want you to know that you were created with the ability to do it. And as we refine some of our skills today around this, I just want you to carry that truth with you. The future of you has to do with the gift that you were born with. And I believe that with 100% of my being. And most of the giftings that you have, they're stuck. And in fact, if you look at that of your parents, you'll probably look and see it. They potentially could have been stuck for their entire life. You could, you could have someone around you, a friend, a family member, a parent, and their gifts are buried in the graveyard of their career. Some of your parents and some of the people that you know or people that you've experienced, maybe they were fired from their job. Maybe it was divine intervention. Maybe it was on purpose so that their gift could get resurrected. I want you to start thinking about this stuff. Sometimes your job or your career or what you actually think you're supposed to do can become your greatest enemy. Why? Because it becomes the enemy of your greatest work. You might not be wired. You might not be supposed to work for somebody else for the rest of your life. Producers are thinkers. Consumers are hoarders. I want you to start looking on the inside and seek within yourself what your gift truly is. If you want to accomplish something absolutely massive in your life and have what many people would call true success, here's the secret. The words that you speak. The ability for you to meditate day and night on what it is that you're really called and, and here to do what your special ability is. And a lot of people will tell you this who really get it. Be careful not to do everything. In fact, intentionally limit yourself. The world is really, really good at telling us what we're bad at, yet not very good at reinforcing the things that we're good at. That doesn't sell books. But the results are this. You will make your way prosperous and have amazing success if you follow some of these principles that I talked to you about today. And the best thing that I can do for you today is I can help you see the bigger picture. And we're gonna have 20 minutes. I'm gonna train you for the next 20 minutes. We'll have about 20 minutes of Q&A at the end. I'm gonna train you how to get into the zone, which I like to call flow, where you can get out of uncertainty, you can get into flow, and you can live a life of generosity, which is the contribution of the greatest gift that you have, which in turn is success. So let's go ahead and talk through that today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you and I'm going to have my iPad here with me and we're going to go over some unique things here today. And if you have any questions that you want to get out now, feel free to go ahead and put them inside of the chat. And then uh, towards the end, I will start answering those questions. So at any moment you'd like to feel free to go ahead and do that. All right. So I want to teach you guys today this concept of flow. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started here. Now I've trained at, at this point, thousands of entrepreneurs on this theory. And it's incredibly helpful when assessing the big ideas around what you want to do. How can you find that internal state of what you're really good at? The, the first question for you is before we even get to this specific part of the training, the first question for you on trying to figure out what you're best at, your zone of genius, there's two different ways. Today, I'm going to show you the flow model. Uh, if I have some extra time, I'll show you one other model that works really well. Um, but honestly, it's the thing that you're best at that no one else can do. No one else can do uh, you know, there's a way again to figure that out, but something that no one else can do. In fact, it's often your 1%. Um, and you know, you've, if you've heard of the 80, 20 rule, I want you to kind of follow that ther theory and go 80, 20 of the 80, 20. And it starts in the process of you suggesting 
here's the things that I'm absolutely hate doing that I'm not good at. And it goes through a model to help you work out what are you the best at that no one else can do. And that's really in your zone of like where you are the best at doing it. And again, a lot of times we don't give ourselves credit for those things and that's one way to solve it. And again, I'll get to that if we can here towards the end to help you figure out what it is really that is your superpower. But first, I can't get you to see your superpower if we don't take the time to figure out how to get there in the first place, all right? So I'm just gonna go ahead and draw this model. And um, let me see how I wanna do this. Yeah, this should work quite well. Awesome, okay. So, most people who I work with have a high level of anxiety. Hopefully you guys can read that a little bit better. So most people I work with, they start here, which basically in this theory suggests that the challenge is very high and the skill level is quite low. So it kind of finds itself over here in this upper left-hand quadrant. So again, the challenge is high and the skill is low. And when you have a big challenge in your life, you want to do something great. You know, it may be college. I want to get a certain uh, grade point average. I want to be the best on the team. But you feel like your skill is something that you're missing. It makes the whole experience very challenging. Now, after anxiety or anxious, I feel like the next area is flow. And flow is your zone of genius. Now, this is where the challenge is high and the skill level is high, all right? It's the highest level of skill at the same time, the highest level of challenge. And, you know, you think of Serena Williams. Does Serena Williams at Wimbledon play better under pressure than she does otherwise? Does she crack under pressure or does she play better under pressure? I can tell you emphatically from her track record, she plays better under pressure. That's because she is in a state of flow. And another way to explain flow is uh, the big idea around optimal performance. Studying human behavior for the last 10 years and also studying people who have followed it longer than I have would suggest that this is the zone of where the most amount of productivity happens. Now we're gonna come back to this big idea because this is also where you're able to find what it is that really makes you come alive and make your greatest impact and contribution, leverage your intuition so you can give your greatest gift to the world. So my goal is to get people out of anxiety, uncertainty, fear, stress into flow. And there's one way to do that. And it's called excitement. Excitement. You got to get excited again. You've got to find the reason why, the bigger understanding of why. And I can tell you for sure with, again, thousands of entrepreneurs that I've gone through this journey with, those who are able to find the thing that can really make them come alive. I, I don't know. Besides the kid who's whining, have you ever gone to Disney and seen someone incredibly upset when they're walking in the front door? No, it's a complete on wonder. It's bliss. They're excited. They've traveled some people around the entire planet to be there and they've planned it for the last 10 years of their lives. Excitement gets them into a state of awe, of bliss, of literally there's nowhere else I would rather be. And that's what we want to create for you. So then flow is held accountable in both directions because water works that way. And on this side, this has to do with release. So if you are anxious and you find yourself getting excited, all right, I'm really pumped about this new relationship, this new you know, class that I'm investing into. I'm really excited about this new opportunity that I have, that this, this mentor that I got a chance to meet who's gonna invest in my life. When you find, that's where things really start to come alive. Now, in order to hold it in balance, we have to stay out of uncertainty, which for me, I'm gonna show you this showcase of how there's three different things that apply to this. We have to stay out of uncertainty and we have to stay out of a mode of control. You can't control flow. The only way you can keep it in balance is by creating excitement and then releasing control. 
So I want to ask you the question, what are the things personally, professionally as a student, and spiritually that you need to let go of? This is just Queen Elsa. Let it go. What do you need to let go of? Personally, it may be the expectations of your family. Everyone's riding on you being the first person to graduate college. You need to let it go. Otherwise, you map to the expectations of other people. You cannot operate in your zone of genius and you cannot leverage your intuition to create success. You will create success for them and when you're 45, you'll resent them. Professionally, falls under the same paradigm, the same pattern. Or right now, are you in a program because someone else said it was the best idea for you or because you knew it was what you were supposed to do? And listen, we can never be 100% certain, but we can own the decisions of our future by allowing ourselves to make the final decision. Another one is spiritually. You may have had a very bad experience spiritually in looking at the greater divine things of the world. You know, I, I, I'll say it this way, when it comes to success under this paradigm, the bigger the why, the bigger the try. And if you find yourself with an ability to have a big why that is beyond your own success or even that of some other people around you, but you feel like you are on mission from some divine intervention, you will go further. Business at some level for everyone becomes spiritual. It always happens, and I can tell you in entrepreneurship, it happens 85% of the time for people who are willing to recognize it. You just have to be willing to open that conversation for yourself. So again, this professional, uh, personal, professional, spiritual, it happens in each area, but in release, this is where you can really start seeing this principle start coming alive. Now, after release, comes generosity. Generosity. Generosity is very cool. You know, I've met people who have built massive companies. One of my mentors built a 40, $40 million coaching business based on human potential. He's 71 years old. Uh, he was making a million dollars a month personally from his business. I have another, uh, another mentor who built a $50 million company in seven years. Money is never the thing. Money is the consequence of doing what you love well. Success. What is success? Intuitive nature of the mission, the reason why you were sent here and what your purpose is here on earth. You will never find that on the opposite side of this chart and anxiety stress or fear you will never find it this is why i like the principle of fear overflow these are interconnected when you're stressed you need to release when you're anxious you need to find someone to give to and i even want to suggest a way of finding your intuition a way of keeping that flow state the optimal performance state the way of finding that is sometimes by giving the thing that you need how many of you would love some extra money right now? Anybody? All right. Why don't you go give what you have to someone who has a greater need than you? That's the way that you start manifesting way, way, way greater levels of what's possible in your life because it forces you to trust something different, the inner prompting in your heart. It, it, it forces you to trust that there's something greater that we're here to accomplish and do. Generosity has the ability to clear anxiousness nearly immediately. If you have the faith that compels you behind the scenes, don't do it for an outcome. Do it out of an act of what you believe is obedience to your intuition. Now, for those of you who study Nikola Tesla, uh, he will tell you that the earth is and the universe is measured in three ways. Uh, it's measured. It's, it's actually right up there on my wall. It's measured in energy and frequency and vibration. Energy, frequency, and vibration. Those are the laws of obedience, right? So you'll see on this chart, this will kind of blow your mind. I think it'd be pretty cool. If I can find uh, this here, yep. We have 
the negative, which is this split. And then we have the positive, which is this side. So for you and where you're at in life right now, I want you to ask yourself the question, are you operating out of a place of anxiety, fear, and stress? Because I can promise you that those things may prompt things that will create success in your life because you'll be so dissatisfied with the status quo. Or are you finding yourself on the opposite spectrum of where you're seeing these unique factors happening in your life of, man, I feel like I'm really on mission. Most people are on mission to find their mission. My question for you is how can we get you closer to just being on mission? It's finding flow. And the way that you do that is when you have a heavy challenge, a high challenge in your life, and you do not feel that you have the skill that's required, I wanna insert one more hack. And that's belief. Most of you are not where you want to be right now simply because you believe that you lack something you lack the charisma, the skill, the ability. There's someone smarter. There's always someone better. Guys, this is not a this is not a one v one game. You against somebody else or one v many. This is an internal game. Your level of belief is the deciding factor on everything that's going to happen in your life. Your level of belief will change the words that you say. It will change the relationships that you have. It'll change the experiences that you pursue very specifically because that is the ultimate hack that will help you get to the level of where you want to be. Steve Jobs said it this way. Those who think they can change the world are the ones who actually do. It requires an audacious amount of belief in order for you to accomplish what's possible in your life. And that's why I think in our culture, we idolize people who are able to create these great businesses or do all these things. What's required to get to that level of success? It requires a few things. And I can tell you for sure that there will be moments of anxiety, of stress, and of fear. But what do two negatives create? It creates a positive. So watch this. If right now, you're feeling anxious and stressed, that's actually a good thing. Fear is a great motivator. When you assign proper meaning to these different elements in your life, it will actually have the very interesting ability to toss you to the other side. But the wild thing is these things are not really taught. These are not conversations that Maybe you've had, this may not have been the conversation that you even planned to show up to today. But I can tell you emphatically that you have a unique calling, that you have a unique gifting. And I believe that you're here for a very specific reason. So when I come back next time, I wanna show you guys how you can also find your zone of genius. And again, there's a unique process four box framework that you can use to uncover it. And uh, if you guys follow me on Instagram or do whatever and just DM me, I'll also give you, give you kind of the early tape on it. Um, but the big idea is that you need to be doing less of what you're not good at because you're most profitable, most successful, most I'm here, I'm on mission to accomplish something great happens in the space where you are the best and that most people do not possess the skill or the intuition or the level of clarity that you have on that big idea. So I hope this was helpful for you guys. I wanna open it up for some Q&A and um, then we can certainly go from there. All right, thank you so much. Um, students, you are able to use the chat box and put in any questions, or there is also a option down there to do question and answers there. But you can drop those uh, for, for Nick in the chat box. And I do see that we do have one question that has come in already. Um, are you able to, to read those or do you need me to? Yeah. Read this? Okay. 
Awesome. Yeah, I can read them. And if we have some time after the Q&A, I can, I can also show the, the four box framework to get you guys started. Um, uh, Natalie said, thank you. This is very helpful. I know I want to help people through nursing, but it's challenging for me to get into nursing school. Should I uh, keep trying or look to see if there is another way to do something similar? Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to position this back to you, Natalie, in a unique way. Um, if you're feeling overwhelmed by resistance, um, I want to redefine what resistance actually is. Uh, if you've traveled on a plane before, which my assumption normally is that most people have, um, the plane needs resistance to take flight. So you know that moment of when you're sitting back in the seat and they're just about to take off, you know, you know flight attendants, please be seated, you know, for takeoff. They sit down and they turn on those thrusters, right? And it kind of pushes you back in your seat. Um, the resistance of that acceleration is what's required in order for the plane to actually take off. So I wanna represent this back to you in the way of, in order for you to actually get into nursing school, resistance is required. Now the level of resistance um, is something that you have to measure. And you know, sometimes, I, you know, I built a two and a half million dollar company in 18 months and I did that and then I realized it wasn't what I wanted to do. So there are moments of where, like I talked about earlier, our, our, our calling or our greatest gifting ends up in a graveyard because like we didn't follow the thread. You've got to look within yourself and say, all right, I'm feeling resistance. Am I feeling anxious and, and uncertain? Or am I feeling you know, anxious and fearful about the future or stressed? You can redefine those things from being negative experiences in your life into actually being the things that are required in order for you to ask yourself this deeper question. So I want to present the question back to you. And I want you to really, really think about if that was the one thing that you were called to do. If you know, when you were anywhere between six and 12 years old, if what you love doing was helping people who had a deep need, um, I want you to look at that question and go like, then am I in the right spot? Am I doing the right thing? What's the silver lining? Were you able to make that assessment and that understanding on your own? Was it prompted by someone else? Advice is one thing. Um, you know, I often say like, you'll be, you know, poked, prodded, pushed, and then punched in life, <laughs> depending upon our ability to listen to our intuition. So it's like that inner deep place for you. Like, what does it really feel like? Does it feel like you're on mission and you know, and it doesn't matter, come hell or high water, you're going to figure it out. That's one sure way to know that you're doing the right thing. If it's not the case and you're just questioning the whole entire bigger picture, then I think that you need to take a step back and really assess, get a pros and cons list out and write it out. It's something that you really feel compelled, called, it's captivating for you to do. And if not, then I would rethink the puzzle. Um, sometimes we end up back at the same position. You know, when I had left school and I had failed out twice, I didn't know what I wanted to accomplish. I was very uncertain of what my future was. That gave me the ability to trust myself. And in that process, it gave me a superpower that I, I would not possess today had I not gone through that experience. So things have a funny way of just working themselves out over time. Uh, but we have to create the space to be able to say, you know what, let me be generous with my gifting. Let me just open my hands and say better as an open hand than a closed fist. Let me just allow myself to release the expectation, get ourselves in a mode of generosity to give to others, maybe go volunteer and see what happens after you take some of those steps. It's awesome. Um, all right, as a parent, how do I help my son out of anxiety, depression, and negativity? Um, absolutely, great question, Hazel. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, and here's what I'm gonna start with and, and show you. Our stories hold the key to flow. Our stories hold the key to flow. And I'm gonna go ahead and screen share here again so I can walk through this with you. Um, and thank you, by the way, for your courage to ask the question, because this is where we can actually get to a point of solving some of this stuff. Um, now, remember, my background is in human potential, so I'm not a therapist, nor do I pretend to be one, but I've been through a lot of therapy knowing that it's actually a, a key to success because my mentors have recommended it because we have so many stories in our life. So I want to outline this for you here quickly, because when you understand this, you'll be able to understand behavior. So our story is the foundation of everything that we create in life. 
So our story leads to our belief systems. And our beliefs lead to our values, which usually we learn from our family. And our values lead to our actions. Sorry, guys, my handwriting is just so terrible, but let me try this again. This is the secret. There's something in your son's story that has a significant limiting factor of belief or a contributing factor towards a negative belief. So I'll tell you one of my stories. I almost drowned as a kid when I was five years old. All right. Uh, I was held down in a pool by a, a young girl who had special needs. I was five. She was probably about somewhere between 12 to 15 years old. And my parents were, you know, we were at a uh, community pool type of thing. And my parents were like chatting with, you know, other people they saw from the community and, you know, it's not a slam on them. They, they didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, but for me, I was really fighting for my life. So my story was that, and my belief system is that water was bad. So my belief system is water is bad and it can kill you. So from the ages of five to when I was 12, I did not step foot in water. And you can imagine, I mean, imagine all the pool parties as kids and like all this stuff. I was petrified of water. So my values adjusted. So some of my values, uh, you know, became safety. Um, uh, another value of mine uh, in, in a positive way, uh, cause I'll tell you about the second half of the story, perseverance. You know, sometimes our bad experiences in life, they, they don't just, or I don't, I don't want to assign meaning good or bad, but the idea is that that situation for me as a five-year-old, I, I viewed as not a good situation, not a beneficial situation, but actually as a funny way of developing uh, things within us that become our greatest strength. It developed for me an unbelievable amount of perseverance to never give up, to never quit. Why? Because I had to fight for my life. Safety also, which kept me out of a lot of trouble in high school. Because I had a lot of fun. Okay, don't get me wrong. But I had the fear of God when it came to my father. <laughs> so I was like, all right, safety is a value of mine because I know what it's like to not be safe, which allowed me to lean on my intuition to judge different situations. <clears throat> now, when it came to actions, you know, this is where, you know, I wouldn't get into water. You know, where I would be very cautious. I, you know, uh, I used my five senses. So the thing I want to tell you about your, your son, the definition of the story that he's been through or the reimagining, the reflection point on his story is what's going to unlock him from anxiety and depression. Human behavior would suggest that the greatest quality, the greatest thing that we experience in life uh, that causes the most amount of hardship is being misunderstood. So as leaders, we try our best to be a lot more understanding and to listen a lot more and dig underneath the surface of the story. The story holds every pattern of belief, uh, of action, and et cetera. A lot of people try to just adjust the action and this is typically like behavior management. Well, behavior management only goes so far and typically it's only when they're very young. So the way that we have to actually unearth it is my suggestion for you would to have your son find someone who will bend an ear towards him and listen to his story, show compassionate curiosity. Tell me more about that. What comes up for you when you suggest that? You know, cognitive therapy is an amazing way for him to find freedom. And I would uh, implore you to do that as quickly as possible. And again, even the meaning behind therapy, a lot of people will be like, well, I don't want to do that because then it suggests I'm broken. We're all broken. We live in a very fractured world. And the only way to get ourselves out of the, uh, the, the creation of a, uh, of a state of being in a victim state 
which is typically where people sit when they have a certain level of these, of course there's chemical imbalances and all these things. But again, I'm coaching a lot of entrepreneurs. We, uh, if we show up as the hero, we attract victims. Victims become villains and go after the hero. You're not the hero. With your son, you're a co-creator. And all you're doing is offering him an opportunity where you give 100% and he gives 100% and you guys are willing to go have the hard conversations you need to with someone who can help you redefine the story. I promise you though, the moment that he can redefine the experiences that he's had in his life, we have to rewatch the movie tapes in the best way that we can without attaching our own emotional truth to them. That's the unlock. You'll say, oh, that isn't what I thought it was. And the moment that we break that, we can create and define a new future. So thank you for the opportunity to talk you through that. And um, I hope that that helps you very much. Thanks, Hazel. Awesome. Thanks, Jose. I'm in the middle of a career change, 20 something years in healthcare to now doing what I enjoy the most. Awesome. Baking. Yeah, I love this. My question is, what's the best way to overcome those moments of, am I doing the right thing? Even though I get excited at what my new plans are for the future, I find fear creeping in uh, and I want to stay on track. Uh, great. Thank you so much for the question. Um, great question. So just rereading the last part, even though I get excited when my new plans are for the future, I find that fear creeps in. Okay. I have a very interesting way to talk about fear, which I do not want to do in an educational setting, but fear, there's another four letter word uh, that is not too kosher. Um, and that's what I call fear. Fear is a, right? So the idea is that, um, let's look at energy. Fear contracts. Anytime you're operating in fear, there's a contraction of what's possible for you. Meaning you go from an expansive thought of abundance into fear, which is contractual in its nature. So the moment that you give into fear by saying, you know what, even that internal conversation, you're right. It's not possible. You're right. This is something that, you know, it's just, it's a pipe dream. Uh, I get all my new ideas, but they don't go anywhere. Right. If you're feeling those feelings, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't know the process. I don't know the stuff. You're in a contraction mode. And the quickest way to get you out of that is to get you excited, okay? And to keep you in that zone. Now, if you're building a business, the challenge can be that you have a great idea, that you get very excited about it, that you get into this place of flow. And when you're inside of that place of flow, finding abundance, you actually just don't know what the next step is. And that's honestly where you need to get a coach somebody who can help you. Now, don't ask me the question of, well, how do I pay for a coach? Because nobody has a coaching budget. I can promise you that. But I can tell you out of 127 million small businesses, 21 million of those businesses want a coach and are actively searching for one. So the statistics would suggest that people know they need it. They just don't necessarily budget for it. Now, look at this. If you're looking to build an actual business off of it, there's six different sectors in business that you're going to look at. You have your mindset, which intuition, a lot of those things fall under, underneath that, your marketing and sales, okay? So six pillars in business. Those are the first ones. Now on this side, you have operations, finance, and client delivery. Now you might just be like, hold on a second, I'm, I'm just a great baker, okay? And that's what I wanna do. No respect, I totally get it. So the client delivery might be the actual baking. And you're like, I love baking more than anything. I'm amazing at it. I have the right process operationally and I'm really good at managing money. Most people who run businesses find themselves on one of these two paradigms of what they're better at. So for me, I'm really good at mindset, marketing, and sales. In fact, operationally, I'm not good at all. Financially, I'm an entrepreneur who gets money and I spend money, right? And client delivery, really, really good at moments of inspiration and really deep thought and having really intense conversations to pull the best out of people. But like, I'm not the person who's going to hold someone's hand for the next year. 
It's just not what my gift is. My gift is to inspire and to get people to a place of taking action. So I'm over here. So if you find yourself on the right, then you need to potentially find someone over here on this side who's really good who can help you. Because if revenue is a problem, that's probably not a problem that you're going to solve. And you have to just be honest with yourself to say, I'm really good at making uh, the, the, the baking, really good at baking, but I may not be really great at knowing how to sell or market or have the right mindset that that's required in order for like really pushing the limits. If you go do research on any of the largest startups that exist to this day, they all have co-founders. You know, it's kind of the saying of, I'd rather have 50% of something than hundred percent of nothing. That's what I want you to think about. Is there someone in your circle, in your life, try not to go family, friends, but maybe an extended network of people that you know, who could help you start packaging the right product, have the right marketing, who can also kind of think, you know, uh, in, in outside the box, they might have unique partnerships who can help you accelerate the delivery and also the revenue generation of your product. So this is what, this is what typically happens is you're on one side or the other, which will show you the deficiencies of where you find yourself right now. Um, I honestly, the way I like to look at it is like this. There's nothing that you're doing wrong by following your passion, you know, and people will judge you either way. So let them judge you, let them throw dirt on you. Dirt is required if you're planting a seed. And what's required is the character that that develops so that you can keep running the race that's required for your life. So like, let them throw stones, let them throw dirt at you, let them talk about you. I invite that stuff now. I'm actually, I get excited when someone's like, trying to talk smack, right? And the reason why is because I understand that means I'm doing something correct. So there is a lot of reassigned meaning, but you've got to look at the whole picture and define what you want. You know, my question for you at the end of the day would be, what do you want? And is this mapping towards what it is exactly that you want in life? So I hope that's helpful. And um, yeah, I would just say that like, fear is just, you can't operate anything out of fear. Nothing good comes from fear. So you have to make a decision to go, how do I get out of fear? Well, I'm going to feel stressed, uncomfortable, uncertain, and that's okay. Let me stay excited. That's going to push you to the opposite side. Go give a bunch of your baking things away to a community or a group or, you know, again, generosity is the boomerang that has a 10 X factor every time it comes back. If you go to uh, you know, a group of a hundred people, uh, whether it's a school or it's a facility or whatever it may be, and you give away the stuff that you've created has a funny way of replicating itself on the way back. So give, give generously, let go of the fear, step into your power by understanding what's possible for you. And I think that's going to be massively helpful and supportive. Uh, okay. I got one more question here from Jose. Do you think Nikola Tesla was able to manage his inventions, um, plan each location materials and construct them so precisely mentally prior to physically? Yes, um, Einstein made a good point where he said, I spend 55, <coughs> excuse me, I spend 55 minutes thinking about a problem and five minutes executing. And because of how much Nikola Tesla studied Einstein and uh, probably followed similar parallels of his level of uh, conception and genius, I, I think that it's uh, rather parallel in the way that they would think. Um, I do believe that he cracked the code on something just absolutely incredible as far as universal truth and how energy functions and all of those things. And I do believe they came from a very deep intuitive place. Uh, let's rather call it spiritual place. And there is a framework that talks around this that I want to show you rather briefly because we have a couple minutes left here and here's how it functions. There are three different layers of consciousness that you're going to find inside of, um, inside of different things that you see in life and business, whatever it may be. The first one is primal. And this is also known as like survival mode, right? Survival mode is primal. Um, you know, for somebody who is, you know, maybe living on the streets, primal survival mode, right? It's kind of what, the natural state of what we're born in. Um, and that's where we find ourselves. The next one is reactive. Now with the election going on, you see a lot of this behavior. In fact, 87% of humanity lives below this line. They are reactive or primal. I'm in survival mode or I am counter punching just about everything that comes my way. Above reactive, we have willing. Now, 
these are people who they'll do whatever it takes. So if you guys know who Gary Vaynerchuk is, a lot of his community settles inside of that group. These are really honestly people who are like, I'll do whatever it takes. Someone who completes in the Navy SEALs, obviously a high level of willingness at the highest echelon, you might have a five out of a 10 in comparison to that. But if you have this gene, I'll do whatever it takes, it's really powerful. Above willing is intellectual. This is the process, the blueprint, right? So going, going back to the Nikola Tesla idea, intellectual process blueprint it's the engineering right these are in no specific order but these are just the levels okay then you have intuitive and the intuitive layer is the inner knowing it's kind of like that sixth sense or spidey sense and then at the very top you have metaphysical or let's call it spiritual you know, this may be kind of fifth dimension stuff if you guys read into that. Um, it's a higher consciousness, et cetera. So the intellectual right here process for Tesla, he probably paired with his intuitive state, which brought him to that meta or spiritual state. It's the combination of intellect and also intuition. But usually what you want to do is if you want to bring someone to an intuitive state, they're usually very willing and yet in the middle, this is what they need to get there. They need an intellectual process. How do I get there? So more than likely he was willing, he was intuitive. He matched his intellectual with his spiritual and that's how he got to that level of understanding. But yeah, from his readings, I mean, he, uh, was, was, he did not shy away from what he believed as spiritual or universal truths. And um, I think that brought him a very long way. So um, thanks Jose. So I was able to answer that one for you as well. Um, Kimberly, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you guys again so much. I hope this was helpful and uh, I hope it was illuminating for you and happy to answer any more questions. Again, uh, give me a shout out on Instagram. Go spend some time with me there. Happy to chat with you guys uh, as well. So. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know even myself, my mind is blown. I'm so excited Ed, about um, using some of these and, and looking up some of the stuff you talked about and I can't wait. I'm so excited and I know our students here are too and I'm starting to seeing thank you, awesome concept, thank you. Uh, this was so powerful and I'm very excited to now get the recording out to more members of the student organization so that they can um, they can hear this also. What an incredible thing that to share. And um, I know for students who are part of NSLS, um, as you do your success networking team meetings, this is something you can refer back to. And as you go into defining those three action steps, um, definitely take this into your, your networking teams to be able to do that. I am going to drop right now in um, the chat box, that is the form that you can go to to be able to put in your big aha moment, your takeaway, and also apply for that $500. Um, they, there are two scholarships left, so you can apply for that, and then that will help you, um, again, continue to work on your goals and achieve your dreams here at the college. So uh, you can submit it there. But Nick, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking this time and sharing with our students. You're so welcome. Absolute honor. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. And then um, students, make sure if you are part of NSLS that you are going through orientation. You should have received those links today. Take your DISC assessment and then also then your next step will go through that leadership training day and um, continue watching out for impact workshops that are available all throughout the year. Um, but everybody have an amazing day. Enjoy this beginning of the week um, here in Arizona. For those of you who are here, it seems our weather is about to cool down. So uh, we are celebrating that and showing lots of gratitude for that as well. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I will still be here to stick around for a moment, but have an amazing day. And thank you, Nick. Go and follow him on Instagram. Uh, he has tons of trainings that are available there, uh, the content there that you are going to continue to be encouraged and inspired by as you reach to your goals. So thank you all. Have an amazing day. Thank you guys. We'll see you.